There are a million reasons that we need a revolution. This is a big one. Watch this. The tragic death of a teenager with autism sparking outrage. Today, the community is rallying around the family of 15-year-old Ryan Gaynor. The teen was shot and killed by a San Bernardino County Sheriff's deputy earlier this month. Where is he at? Hey, get back! Get back! You're getting shot! broken arm, broken leg, but to be dead at 15? No. No, it just don't make no sense. Why do you, why do you think they have this battle? Because he's black. Described as a happy kid, but he had his challenges. 15-year-old Ryan Gaynor was diagnosed with autism and Crohn's disease, but his adoptive father, Norman, says he flourished as he got older. I get to sleep at night because all I think about is Ryan. It's just, uh, it's, Right, he did so much. People don't realize he would he would work at Million My Kids. He was teaching kids robotics. He was teaching teaching kids chess. He was a mentor to younger kids. To all the viewers, make sure you have a great day. Be the spark, and make sure to spread kindness. How many more times does this have to happen? How many more times do the tears and the cries of anguish and anger have to pour forth from the wounded hearts of people? How many more times when another of these outrageous murders is perpetrated by the police do we have to hear those words that pour gasoline on the already burning wounds. Justifiable homicide. Justified use of force by police. How many more? Ramarley Graham, Nicholas Hayward Jr., Tamir Rice, Eric Garner, Darius Pinex, Oscar Grant, Manuel Diaz, Joel Acevedo, Laquan McDonald, Ayanna Stanley Jones, Sandra Bland, Jack Sun, Rennie Davis, Michael Brown, Freddie Gray, Maurice Granton, Harith Augustus. The list goes on and on and on. Thousands and thousands, especially black and Latino and Native American. If this were the only thing wrong with this system, it would be more than enough reason to sweep it off the earth. So what you just saw in that clip was just some footage from the cold-blooded police murder of Ryan Gaynor, a 15-year-old autistic young man by San Bernardino sheriffs. You know, and as Baba Vakian said in that, the clip that followed, if this were the only thing that was wrong with this system, it would be reason enough to sweep it off the face of the earth. In today's show, we're going to share more from the family of Ryan Gaynor, from a press conference they held that the L.A. Revcoms, that is Revolutionary Communists, went out to. We're also going to bring you more from Bob Avakian, who you just heard from briefly. Bob Avakian, you should know, is the revolutionary leader who has developed a whole new framework for human emancipation, what we call the new communism. He is hardcore for a real revolution, and he's brought forward the scientific methodology, the vision of a whole new liberated society, the strategy to make a revolution, and he is providing the leadership to make this real in these times. And one of the things that is most distinctive about him through his whole life and development from a very early age is his deep connection 
to black people and to the struggle for their liberation. And as he's developed this new communism, he's deepened our understanding, humanity's understanding of how closely the fight for the liberation of black people is bound up with the fight to make revolution to emancipate all of humanity. So in today's show, we are also at the heart of the show going to share an excerpt where he goes very deeply in a speech into why you cannot end white supremacy without overthrowing capitalism, how they're bound together and how we need to make revolution to abolish both. So later in the show, we're going to be talking about the repression that's coming down now on pro-Palestinian voices speaking out against the U.S.-backed genocide in Gaza. And we're going to be talking about a protest that happened recently at UCLA against the UC University of California Board of Regents. So before we dive into all of this, we want to give a fuller sense of the scope of this revolution with one more short clip from Bob Avakian. Why are black people, Latinos and Native Americans subjected to genocidal persecution, mass incarceration, police brutality and murder? Why is there the patriarchal degradation, dehumanization and subjugation of all women everywhere? and oppression based on gender or sexual orientation? Why are there wars of empire, armies of occupation, and crimes against humanity? Why is there the demonization, criminalization, and deportations of immigrants and the militarization of the border? Why is the environment of our planet being destroyed? There is one fundamental reason. The basic nature of the system of capitalism imperialism that we live under and the way because of its very nature it continually perpetrates and perpetuates horror after horror and in fundamental terms we have two choices either live with all this and condemn future generations to the same or worse if they have a future at all or make revolution. So Raphael, we started with this clip, this really beautiful clip of a, of a glowing, I mean, really sweet, young black youth, Ryan Gaynor, talking about how you should be the spark you want to see in the world, somebody who's just got an incredible smile. Um, he's a young man with autism, and he was experiencing a breakdown, uh, some kind of mental breakdown, an episode, and his family called for emergency line for help. And they've done this before. They called for help. The police came. And instead of offering help, they did what has happened way too many times to way too many families, and especially disproportionately to black families, to Native American families, Latino families. Instead of bringing help, they shot this child dead in front of his family is a nightmare that they had to go through. It's really sickening, you know? I mean, I just about lost it like multiple times watching these videos, watching the family speak at this press conference. It's, this should not go on any longer. This is, this family, this was the fifth time this family called the police for help. They knew exactly what was going on. They knew he, uh, they knew about Ryan Gaynor. The police knew, The police knew, I'm sorry, the police knew. They knew he was having a mental breakdown, you know, but, from the minute they arrived there, you know, with their guns out when they showed up, you know, they they treated they didn't treat Ryan as someone to be helped. They treated Ryan as someone to be put down, a th- dangerous threat to be put down. You know, despite the fact that as as his aunt said at the beginning, he you know, he just had a gardening tool and a frying pan and the police could have dealt with this so many other kind of ways and we'll we'll get more into this when we hear from the family in a minute. You know, but it just tells you so much about this country and about the way the inhumanity that black people are treated with, you know, when they have to deal with these police. You know, and even after they shot Ryan, you know, there and and his, his you know, his family members are saying, "Why did you shoot my my baby?" You know, they're they're telling them, "Get back. Stay away." Like they're not they they didn't and then it took a another like 60 seconds before they even tried to, you know, administer any, you know, medical care towards Ryan. You know, it's just, you know, and then we'll later we'll hear from the family members describing what the family went through after that. You know, how they themselves were fa- faced with arrest. We're going to play more from the press conference where his aunt, his father spoke, um, where some of the members of the 
Los Angeles Revcom Corps for the Emancipation of Humanity went out, filmed this press conference, interviewed the family. We're going to bring you more of that. But one other thing I want to note before we do is that the San Bernardino sheriffs Mm -hmm. actually put out a press release that described this incident where they cut this kid down in cold blood as an encounter where he, they put this, I want to quote it, attempted murder of peace officer. Think about that. Attempted murder, like this 15-year-old attempted murder on a peace officer. It's the exact opposite. These were not peace officers. These were murdering thugs. They're the violent ones. And they were the ones who carried out the murder. And even after the fact, even caught on camera, this is how they're telling it to the world. This has got to stop. I think we should uh, go to the press conference, hear from the family. Do you want to describe what we're going to share? So we're going to hear from Ryan Gaynor's father who, you know, describes what kind of person Ryan was and his struggles growing up, but also how he came to flourish as a young man. Um, And then until he was cut down, then we're going to talk about, uh, then we're going to hear from his aunt who describes the way the family was treated and, and how this needs to stop. Just to tell you who Ryan was and all the things he overcame, in 2010, we did foster to adopt, and we adopted Ryan. The adoption was final in 2011. When we first met Ryan, he had a helmet on his hand. They said he was prone to falling. The first thing I did, I got rid of the helmet. And Ryan, Ryan was a uh, drug exposure and alcohol fetal sy- syndrome. And Ryan was a uh, speech delay. Ryan could not speak. And we was like, how are we going to communicate with this kid? How are we going to communicate with this kid? So we we taught him sign language just to communicate that he can tell us if he's hungry or if he's not hungry. And we took him to our home when they let allow us to take to our home. And then we discussed it with my wife and my daughters about should we adopt, should we not adopt, because he had a lot of issues. And then my daughter said, uh, why would you bring him home if you don't want to adopt him? And she said, we all got issues. And then we, after she said that, we agreed to adopt him. Then he started talking. It's like, wow, thank God. He started talking, he started communicating, he started flourishing. And he, he went through so much. There was so much he dealt with. Uh, and this at the age of three. He dealt with so much. And then they diagnosed it with seizures. He was having fiber seizures. You know, and then later on, they diagnosed with Crohn's disease. He wasn't able to control his bowel movement or his urine movement. And he just, he was strong. He was always happy no matter what he was going through. He was always a happy child. Even, even in school, the battles Ryan fought. Going to school and kids teasing because he had to wear pull up because he had Crohn's disease. We had to deal with that. But he was always happy. He just wanted to be treated the same. If anyone can tell you how our son just flourished, he, he, became, he just, he loved it to talk, from not talking to talking all the time. And he was so smart. I said, I gotta Google it, son. And when he, when he, he liked it, the Lakers, he liked it, um, San Francisco, he liked it, the Dodgers, but he knew all the stats. So I'm like, how do you, how do you uh, keep up with all that? He was like, had a sponge in his brain, it was a sponge. When every time I said, when you get off the school, call me. He's like, Dad, I'm home, this is Ryan. I said, how was your day, Ryan? He said, my day was good. Some days was good, some days was bad. And I said, Ryan, do you have any homework? I said, do your homework first and do your chores. And after you do your chores, you need to have your computer time. So that's, that's the Ryan I know. That's the Ryan I remember. That's the Ryan that I miss. I get him to sleep at night because all I think about is Ryan. It's just, uh, it's, Ryan, he did so much. People don't realize if you knew Ryan, you love Ryan. The people that said these negative things, they don't know Ryan. Ryan never... Never, I had never heard a bad word from anybody in the community about Ryan. The morning I, my sister called me, she was just screaming on the phone, they shot my baby, they shot my baby. And I go down to the police station because I find out that they got my sister down at the police station for three and a half hours. So I called on that phone and I said, why you got, got my sister down here? She needs to talk to detective. No, she doesn't. Right. She didn't shoot him. Right. Why is she being held in a, in a jailhouse? She didn't shoot him. Then after we go to the hospital, after they gave us the false pretense that my nephew was still alive, we get pulled into a room and they tell us. The doctor says, when he came in, he had no pulse. He said, well, I opened him up and his heart had no heartbeat. So I told that detective, you call down to that jail cell and you tell them to release my sister right now. And I go 
go back down there and now they're playing games. Oh, well, who are you talking about? What, what's, what, what's her name again? Mm -hmm. Then as my sister's trying to roll, my niece is trying to roll my sister out, the detective, the police officer is standing in front of my sister, preventing her to come out. And guess who had to tell my sister that her baby was dead? <laughs> I did. I had to tell my sister that my nephew that was over to my house at Christmas time when we had our dinner, that he was no longer here. When I say a gentle young man would not hurt a flea, so my question to the police is, you have you could have did a thousand other things. Right. You could have tackled him, right. you could have tased him, you could have pepper sprayed him. There was a whole lot of things you could have did. The system needs to change. Because if not, we'll be having this press conference again at somebody else's house. Somebody else's mama will be standing in front of here crying about their baby or somebody's aunt or cousin. Change needs to happen, and it needs to happen now. We've had enough of this, right. and I'm I'm not saying I'm, I'm not sorry for what I'm saying, but I'm telling you, it's happened to the black community more than it's happened to anybody else. We are burying more than anybody, and now we got to bury my nephew. I don't want to bury my nephew, but we can't bring him back. So we have to. But why? That's my question. Why? In watching that, you feel the, the agony that this family has been put through. And that so many families have been put through whose loved ones have been murdered by police. And Ryan Gaynor's aunt, Sheila, is exactly right when she says this is happening disproportionately to black people. It's also happening disproportionately to Native American people and Latino people. And this needs to stop or else it will be exactly like she said, another family standing in front of their home, pouring out their tears yet again. This murder after murder by police needs to stop. And we need to do exactly what she said at the end. We need to be asking the question, why does this keep happening? Why is it going on? This needless, senseless murder. And if it were easy to answer that question... We would have had a change that we need by now. We would have seen the kind of change we need. And people have tried. They have stood up. They have protested. They have rebelled. And we need much more of that. But a lot of this has been funneled into things that have not gotten to the root of the problem. We've seen body cameras put on police. We've seen uh, sensitivity trainings. We've seen police review boards. We've seen all kinds of reforms. But we have not seen this stop. In fact, 2023 saw the highest rate of police murder in years, actually ever. So this is going up, not down. So to get to the root of why this keeps happening and why only an actual revolution, only the overthrow of the system that we live under can put an end to this murder by police, even as we should be standing up and protesting and resisting this now, we want to go to something from Bob Avakian, where he goes into this deeply and scientifically in a way that no one else has in his speech, why we need an actual revolution and how we can really make revolution how white supremacy and capitalism are woven together and to end one, you have to end both. Let's watch. The oppression of black people and other people of color. This system in this country was founded in genocide and slavery. From the beginning, African Americans and Native Americans were treated as pariahs, a caste of people less than human and not deserving of the same rights and opportunities as the European settlers of the territory. White supremacy was poured into the foundation and into every institution of the country. The uniting of the United States was accomplished through the compromise written into the founding constitution that institutionalized slavery and for generations, slave labor produced a great part of the wealth of this country. As I said in Basics 1-1, there would be no United States as we now know it today without slavery. That is a simple 
and basic truth. And then, when it was no longer possible to contain the conflicts that had been somewhat held in check by the founding compromise, the Civil War erupted between the southern slave states and the northern states, which increasingly were based on the exploitation of wage labor by capitalists. But shortly after the end of this Civil War, another compromise was engineered, which was a continuation of the original compromise under the new conditions. The country was put back together on the basis of reaffirming and reinforcing white supremacy. With the masses of black people still overwhelmingly in the South, subjugated and terrorized into second-class citizen status, exploited in conditions of near slavery and sometimes still literal slavery by white plantation and other property owners. And the land and way of life of the native peoples was further stolen through armed conquest and decimated by slaughter, confinement in reservations, and cultural genocide which has resulted in the poverty, oppression, and repression that continues to be inflicted on Native Americans to this day. Under slavery, it was the armed patrols and militias organized by the slave owners that hunted down slaves who rebelled or just tried to escape and terrorized the masses of black people as a whole. After slavery, with Jim Crow segregation, it was the Ku Klux Klan, together with local sheriffs, who largely played this role. Today, in the conditions in which masses of black people in the ghettos of the inner cities find themselves, the role that was played in the past by the slave patrols, and then the Ku Klux Klan and local sheriffs, is now carried out by heavily armed urban police forces. This is a big part of the overall role of the police, which, as I said in Basics 124, is not to serve and protect the people. It is to serve and protect the system that rules over the people, to enforce the relations of exploitation and oppression, the conditions of poverty, misery, and degradation into which the system has cast people and is determined to keep people in. The law and order the police are about, with all their brutality and murder, is the law and order that enforces all this oppression and madness. In the days of slavery and then Jim Crow segregation after the Civil War, the oppressors viciously exploited and terrorized black people, brutally murdering those they saw as posing a threat or not staying in their place. But they did not kill off or incarcerate a huge part of the black population because their labor was needed as a backbone and crucial source of profit for the cotton plantations and the overall economy in the South and the country as a whole. Today, with great numbers of black people concentrated in the inner cities, and with many factories and other capitalist enterprises having moved away from the urban cores, the police have killed thousands of black people in the last few decades, and they play a key part in forcibly maintaining masses of black people in a situation where especially youth robbed of any decent future under this system are killing each other in the thousands and millions are either incarcerated or in some other way under the control of the so-called justice system. Because white supremacy is such a defining part of this country, it is not just African Americans and Native Americans but people of color generally who are subjected to discrimination, degradation, and brutality. And this applies now in acute ways 
to those whose roots lie in Mexico, El Salvador, and other parts of Central America and the Caribbean, which are tightly ensnared in a net of domination and exploitation by the imperialists of the USA, whose ravaging of these countries has driven many to emigrate to the US itself. White supremacy and capitalism, they have been completely interwoven and tightly stitched together through the whole development of this country down to today. To attempt to really put an end to white supremacy while maintaining the system of capitalism would tear the entire fabric of the country apart. White supremacy and capitalism. It is not possible to overcome and finally abolish the one without overthrowing and finally abolishing the other.